If you haven't already, sit for a moment in a quiet place away from any big distractions. Just sit with your back pretty straight and become aware of your breathing and your heartbeat. Look around you. Listen to the sounds you can hear. Don't try to label them or figure out where they're coming from. Feel how your skin feels and your muscles. If you can, let yourself release all thoughts. Don't fight or judge them, just let them go. How does that feel? Now tune back into me. You were just meditating, which is closely related to the topic of today's video, meditative literature. Meditative literature differs from most of the ancient writing we've been reading so far because it turns from heroes, gods, and magic to ordinary everyday human beings moving through the normal non-magical world. In this way, it's the first step away from theism or a worldview that is centered on supernatural beings and their desires toward humanism or a worldview that is centered on human beings and our wants and needs. There are various theories about when and why this shift occurred, and it happened at different times in different places. One interesting idea is that the war-filled and tumultuous periods that created epics led people to become disillusioned with empire, conquest, heroes, and public life. So they turned inward to examine themselves and seek peace. On the other hand, meditative writing could have been going on for centuries and we simply don't have any written examples that survived. Meditative literature is usually marked by a few qualities you might have experienced in our short experiment at the beginning of this video. The topic is usually the author and his or her thoughts and experiences. The author usually has those experiences alone or retells them to him or herself in a journal or diary. And the tone is often peaceful and curious, though many works will end by dismissing thoughts and ambitions as completely useless. Meditative writings also employ images from nature, often in a symbolic way. For example, the jasmine flower is often a symbol of sexuality and desire in Spanish poetry, while the peach blossom can connote long life in Chinese and Japanese culture. Knowing some of these common or stock cultural symbols can help you understand meditative writing better. So feel free to look up the symbolism of any images that seem really important or weighty, but that you don't understand. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule, especially in this genre. Li Bai, one of China's most famous poets, was famous for writing rowdy poems about being drunk on wine, often while being drunk on wine. And some meditative works reflect on man's use of technology. The main thing you'll notice is that most meditative or reflective works express the author's personal observations thoughts, and emotions as he or she strives to understand and live life. This description might sound similar to didacticism or even myth, which we discussed in these earlier videos. And some meditations can be written to teach or instruct others about the truths of life that the author has discovered. But for the most part, Meditative writing rejects clear answers or lessons. Meditative writing is more likely to ask questions or to lead the reader to ask them themselves. Now you may ask, why is that? The answers are complex because meditative literature arose in many different cultures at different times. However, some of the best examples come from cultures that embraced Buddhism or the teachings of the Buddha. 
Check out the link in the description box for more information on Buddhism. But just know for now that it arose in India and one of its central beliefs is that nothing is permanent. Under this belief system, answers aren't quite as important as they are in Western thought because the answers will always change, right? The path to enlightenment, or at least to less suffering, is awareness of reality as it is now, not as we wish or believe it to be. And this awareness or mindfulness is exactly what meditative writing captures. So as you read the works in this unit, pay attention to what the author is paying attention to. What does he or she see, smell, taste, hear, and touch? And what do these things mean to him or her? What does the author embrace by the end? And what does this tell us about their personal path to enlightenment? 